talk, explain what is packet switching, and then we'll come back and compare circuit and packet switching so both of them make a bit more sense. Circuit switching, we establish a connection from source to destination via circuit switching nodes, intermediate nodes. And once that connection is established, we can send our data. In fact, think of it, we, when we send the data, we send our signal from source all the way to the destination. That is, if I create a connection from my computer to a computer in the US via a circuit switch network, by a set of intermediate nodes, once the connection's established, the signal that I send, analog or digital, passes all the way through the network as is to the destination. It's as if we have one link from source all the way to the destination with circuit switching. With packet switching, we do something different. We take the data that we want to send and split it into packets. and we send one packet at a time, that is transmit. If I have data to send and I split it into three packets, then I would send data packet one, and then packet two, and then packet three. And they should arrive at the destination somehow via our per packet switch network, and they'll be combined back together to get our original data. <coughs> there are two pro approaches for how those packets are delivered through the packet switching network. Datagram packet switching and virtual circuit packet switching. We'll go through datagram packet switching with a, a simple example and then virtual circuit packet switching. So here's an example network. We have a source and a destination and the circles are packet switching nodes. These are devices in the network that have the role of getting the data from the source to the destination. And the lines are linked let's say cable, and it may be across a country, across a city, across the world, it doesn't matter. It's our network connecting source to destination. So the source has some data to send to the destination, and with datagram packet switching, when we have that data, we divide it into multiple packets. Normally there'll be a defined maximum size of a packet. Let's say if I had 3,000 bytes of data to send, and my application or the source has 3,000 bytes of data to get from the source to the destination, maybe we'd have a maximum packet size which contains 1,000 bytes. So we can say we'd have packet one, which has 1,000 bytes of data, and we'll see shortly, normally we'll have a header as well. And packet two, the next 1,000 bytes, plus header, and packet three. Where the amount of data included in each packet would be part of a particular protocol, a particular system. That would be defined, what is the maximum size of data in a packet. But in general, we think if we have packets, which contain parts of the data we want to get from source to destination. So in this example, we've got our 3,000 bytes of data, we split it into three packets, and we transmit those packets from the source to the first packet switching node, one at a time. Send packet one, and then packet two, and then packet three. So that's what the source does, and that's shown here that these boxes are the packets. They go to the first packet switching node, so this is the first thing we do. In datagram packet switching, there's no concept of setting up a circuit, setting up a uh, virtual circuit. We simply take the data and transmit as packets. It goes to the first packet switching node, and that receives packet one, and then it will receive packet two, and then packet three. And it makes a decision uh, to send those packets towards the destination. So, in our example, for, for example, packet one, so the first packet switching node receives those packets, and actually we skipped a part. First node receives the packets, 
and decides, let's say, to send all of those three packets to this node in this example. It's got an option. It can send them in this direction or this direction. And in, importantly, with datagram packet switching, it treats the packets independently, which means it can choose to send packet one in this direction and then packet two in this direction and then packet three in this direction. It's allowed to choose them. It's allowed to treat the packets differently, even though they belong to the same data. In fact, normally the packet switching node doesn't care that these three packets belong to the same original piece of data. It just treats them independently. Here's a packet, send it on to the next node in order to reach the destination. So let's say that the first node sends to this second node, and then the next slide gives an example, okay, while, and because we transmit them in order, as packet one is being transmitted, the, well, packet one was transmitted to this node, and when this node receives packet one, it can start transmitting to the next node in the path. And while this node is transmitting packet one to this node, packet three may be coming to this node. Here we have two different links. So this node transmits packet one, and then two, when this one has received packet one, it can start transmitting onto the next node at the same time as it's receiving packet three from the previous node. So from an individual node's perspective, it may be transmitting packets to the next node and at the same time receiving packets from a previous node because it has multiple links. That is, this node has three links. It can be transmitting on this link at the same time as receiving on this link. So in this case, packets one and two are being transmitted to this second node. Again, there's an option as to what path the packets could take, and the node chooses which path to take. And eventually the packets get delivered through the network. And here's showing that the pa packets may take different paths. This node received packet one, decided to send it in this direction, received packet two, followed the same direction, and then received packet three and decided for whatever reason to send in this direction. That's possible in datagram packet switching. The packets can go any way as long as they get to the destination. Why would we send them in different directions? Maybe we realize that the network is busy in this direction. That is, this node is very busy. It's receiving a lot of packets. We cannot send very fast to it. So we start sending them across a path which is less busy. Same as if you're driving into Bangkok, you're taking one path and then you realize that there's congestion, there's a traffic jam, then you may try and take a different path. So the cars, if the cars are the packets, some cars are going along one path and other cars notice congestion or traffic jam and go and take a different path to try to avoid that congestion. That may be one reason for sending packets in different paths. And the packets get forwarded via the packet switching nodes towards the de destination. Because the packets may take different paths, they may arrive in a different order in which they were sent. Packets one and two took this path. Packet three took this path. It may turn out that the data rates of these links are much faster than these links, and the propagation delay of these links is much less. In other words, the time it takes for packet three to get from here to here may be shorter than it takes packet one and two to get from here to here. So packet three may arrive at this node before packets one and two. That's possible. This node will receive the packets and forward them on to the destination. And Either this node will put them back into the order or even the destination will put, put them back into the order. If they arrive at the destination as 321 or 132, that is they arrive out of order, 
someone, either the last packet switching node or the final destination, needs to put them back into order. Because we need them in order, one, two, and three, to reconstruct the original data. So in a packet switching network, a datagram packet switching network, packets are sent through the network, they are treated independently by the packet switching nodes. A node just receives a packet and sends it across the next link in order to reach the destination. The next packet it receives, it makes a decision independent of the previous packet. There's not any relationship between packets from the packet switching nodes perspective. And therefore, possibly packets may arrive out of order and therefore it's up to the destination or the last packet switching node to put them back into order. And therefore we'd have sequence numbers in those packets. Inside the header, this packet would have a sequence number one, this one two, this one three. So that at the receiver we know to put them back into order of one, two and three. Let's compare that to an alternative approach. <coughs> And another type of packet switching is virtual circuit packet switching. With datagram packet switching, we took the data, create packets, send them. With circuit switching covered yesterday, we created a circuit from source to destination, sent that data as signals across the circuit. Virtual circuit packet switching uses packets but tries to act like a circuit. That is, we establish some connection between source and destination and then send the packets. What does this show us? Well, between a set of stations in some network, in the concept of virtual circuits, or sometimes called virtual connections, between a source and some destination, before we send data, we'll establish a virtual circuit or a virtual connection. And then we'll send data across that circuit or connection. And we'll send that data as packets in a packet switching network. So what we do with virtual circuit packet switching, we have our data originally at the source, say 3,000 bytes, divide it into three packets as an example. Before we send those packets, we need to establish our circuit or a virtual circuit. So, although it's not shown here, we would send a special packet through the network saying, I want to set up a circuit from source to destination. And in this example, that special packet would flow from this, the source would send to the first packet switch and that would choose the next packet switch and in this example, it goes in this path. This would be the path of the first, let's say, a connection request packet. A re packet to request setting up a connection between source and destination. The destination would see, receive this and respond saying, yes, I will accept your connection and send back a special response along the same path. And then the three packets are sent in order along that path. The packets go along that one path. All packets follow the same path in this case until they arrive at the destination. So first, the difference between datagram packet switching and virtual circuit packet switching. In datagram packet switching, simply send the packets into the network let the network deliver them along the best path it chooses. Virtual circuit approach, before we send the packets, set up a connection from source to destination. And then the packets which are sent will always follow that connection, that is, always follow that path. Packets one, two, and three will be sent to the first switch. The first switch will recognize these three packets belong to the connection from this source to this des destination. And therefore we'll recognize, okay, 
we've previously had a connection set up. These three packets all need to go to this node. And when this node receives the packets, it will recognise these three packets belong to the connection from A to B. Therefore, I need to send them to this node. So the packets will follow the same path through the network. As a result, the packets should, will, will arrive in order because we always send packet 1, 2 and 3 because they go along the same path, they will arrive as 1, 2 and 3. There's no problem of getting out of order packets at the receiver. Okay, that's the overview of the difference between datagram and virtual circuit packet switching. Now let's look at some of the details. Before we look at this slide, first let's look at a normal circuit switching. So just make note we have have three three approaches. It is Okay, so let's explain go back and, and cover a little bit about circuit switching. So and compare these three approaches and try and answer that question of the difference between circuit switching and virtual circuit packet packet switching. With circuit switching when we talk about the data we're sending, we think about the transmission of signals. I'll draw that as a square. Let's say this is the path that we choose. There are other paths to take. But we choose for circuit switching to establish a connection from source A to destination B via this path or a set of circuit switching nodes. To do that, what we do is send a special signal. The source who wants to connect to B sends a special signal to the first node who determines can it allocate resources for this connection. If so, sends it on to the next one and the next one until it comes to B and B responds with a, some acknowledgement saying, yes, I'll accept your connection. The example we gave yesterday was a telephone call. You dial in someone's number, your phone sends a signal all the way through the telephone exchanges to your destination's phone. Their phone rings. When they pick up that phone, that sends a signal back and then the connection is established. So there's a special signal or, or message sent from source to destination to establish the connection. In fact, we'll see that's similar with virtual circuit packet switching. Once we've established that connection, you could think, let's get a different colour. <coughs> These lines are, are, are links, physical links. When we establish the connection, we connect inside the circuit switch, one link to the, the input link to the output link. That's where we saw with the old style telephone exchange, some connection in a digital circuit, we can use a, a digital connection between, a digital cross connect between those two input, the input and output. And same here and here. So this is virtual, this is circuit switching example. We establish a connection. Now, from the perspective of A and B, we have a link directly between them. It's as if we have a cable from A all the way to B, even though they may be on the other side of the world. Because we have connections inside these switches, now if we send a signal 
an analog or digital signal from A, it goes across the first link, it goes through this switch, it's just a, a link here, and it goes across the second link, and it goes all the way to the destination B. So imagine this blue link here as just a very short piece of cable connecting two other cables together, connecting these two together. As a result, we have a long cable from A through to B, and we can send a signal, analog or digital, along that cable as if we have one long cable between them, one link. And we transfer our data in that approach. So, for example, the propagation delay from A to B is simply calculated as the total distance, which is the sum of the distance of all the links, divided by the transmission speed, and say the speed of light. So once we've established the connection, you can think of this as just one link. You can think of it as this. And you can think of all the calculations of propagation delay, transmission delay, applying to one link. So that's circuit switching. With virtual circuit packet switching, let's draw this again. With virtual circuit packet switching, we try to emulate circuit switching except we're sending packets. We're not necessarily looking at the individual signals. That is, we establish a connection from A to B, we send a special packet from A to the first switch saying I want to establish a connection and then on, so we establish a connection. We don't connect the two links together, we just reserve some resources in this device and tell it that, okay, in memory it stores, there's a connection from A to B. And so this device, this computing device stores some information that's saying there's a connection from A to B. If we give them numbers, switch one, two, and three, this one would store there's a connection from A to B, the next switch is switch two. This one would store there's a connection from A to B, the next switch is switch three, for example. And this one, the next device is B. So they store some information about that connection. So now, we don't send our data as, we don't treat the data as one piece in packet switching, we break it into packets. In circuit switching, if we had our 3,000 bytes of data to send, we would just transmit that all as one piece of information. But with packet switching, both of these approaches, we transmit a packet to the first switch, and then that first switch, once it's received the entire packet, it will look here, okay, I've received a packet, it's from A to B, it needs to go to switch two, I, it will transmit that packet to switch two. And then of course the second packet would arrive and the same thing would happen. And Switch one would transmit the packet to switch two and see, okay, connection from A to B, I need to send to switch three. So we transmit packets one at a time. If this is packet two, at one point in time, packet one can be being transmitted from switch one to switch two across this link, and at the same time, packet two is being sent from A to one. Because we have two different links, we can be transmitting on them at the same time. They're separate links. And the packets flow through the network to the destination, and they flow along the same path, or all packets along the same path. So, comparing circuit switching with virtual circuit packet switching, both of them we set up a connection before we transfer data, but with circuit switching, real circuit switching, once we establish a circuit, 
we have a physical link all the way from source to destination. And we can send a signal across that link. And the switching nodes simply pass that signal through them with circuit switching. It's as if the signal goes right through them. They do nothing with that signal. With virtual circuit packet switching, we establish a connection or a circuit, but we send our data as individual packets. The switching node must receive an entire packet before it sends it on to the next node. And similar for the other node. Datagram packet switching don't establish a connection. Just send the packets. And the packets may go either direction. It's up to the, uh, the network to decide which direction the packets go. This diagram... Uh, no, let's not go to this diagram yet. Let's use another example. Let's give an example calculation for how long it takes to transmit our data. Actually, it's one of the later slides. This slide. This slide compares the three approaches. Circuit switching, virtual circuit packet switching, datagram packet switching. And what it's showing, time is increasing as we go down. And these vertical lines show the different nodes. Think of the first node, the second node, the third node, and the fourth node. So there's a path. Here we had three nodes in the middle, plus the source and destination. Here we just have two nodes in the middle. So what happens with circuit switching, the first case? First, we need to establish a circuit. So the source sends a special signal to the first node saying, I want to establish a circuit. In this diagram, it's called a call request signal. You make a call, you're requesting to establish a, a connection, a call, or a circuit. So this request signal is sent to the first node. It's processed. The first node checks. Do I have enough resources to accept this connection? If yes, then send it to the next node. And this node checks. Do I have enough resources to send to the next, to accept the connection? If yes, sends to the destination. The destination says, will I accept this connection? It's like the person you're calling, do they pick up to accept the phone call? And if they accept, they send back a signal along the same path through those nodes back to the source. In this case, we have, you can think of it as the source, node 2, node 3, and the destination. Four nodes involved, three links. Link 1, 2, and 3. Send a signal to each node requesting a connection. If everything's OK, send back a response saying your connection is accepted. And now our connection is set up. These two nodes now have links creating a circuit between source and destination. And what this diagram shows is both transmission time and propagation time. Transmission is the time from the start of the blue to the end. Same when we talked about transmitting frames. We drew the transmission time as we start transmitting here, we finish transmitting here, and the frame propagates across the link. So the frame, the first bit propagates, arrives here, the last bit is transmitted and propagates and arrives here. So that's what this diagram is showing, the transmission of the special call request signal, and it propagates across the link. And then once it's received from the first node, it propagates, it's transmitted and propagates across the second link and the third link. Once the request has been sent through, these two nodes set up a 
circuit connection between each of the links. In fact, the response can flow all the way back without any processing at the intermediate node. And once the connection's set up, we can transmit our data. So the user has some data to send. It takes this amount of time to transmit from the source. With circuit switching, we simply transmit and that signal flows all the way through our link to our destination. So it's as if now that these two nodes don't exist. It's as if we have a link directly between source and destination. As you'll see, transmission time at the source plus the propagation time to get from source to the destination. So with one link from source to destination, the delay it takes is just the time to transmit the data plus the time to propagate the data. And in circuit switching, we may close the connection at the end. So there may be some acknowledgement signal to say, we're finished, we've received your data, the connection's closed. Now, what about packet switching? Here's virtual circuit packet switching. It tries to emulate what we have here, and you see there's similarities. We request a connection, a virtual circuit, by sending a special packet to the first node. It processes saying, can I accept? Yes, send to the next node. Do I accept? Yes, send to the next one. Does the destination accept this connection? Yes. Sends back a response packet. But with packet switching, all packets must be received in their entirety before they were sent across the next link. And that especially comes up here. We've received the response, we've set up the virtual circuit. Now we have our data to send. Same amount as data as we had here, but we've now split it into three packets. So what we do is we transmit the first packet across the first link take some time to transmit, some time to propagate. After the source has started transmitting the first packet, it can start transmitting the second packet and then the third packet, one at a time. When the first no or node two receives the first packet in full, in its entirety, it checks, does some processing, checks where it needs to go, realizes that this packet needs to go to node three and transmits packet one to node three. So this node receives packet one, looks at it, transmits onto the next node. At the same time that node two is transmitting packet one to node three, node two is receiving packet two from the source. We have two different links coming into node two. The input link, and an output link. So it's receiving a packet on one link and transmitting another packet on another link at the same time. And that's shown here, receiving packet two, transmitting packet one. When node three receives packet one, it looks at the packet, looks at the header, determines to transmit to the destination node four in this case. Transmits packet one, and similar for the subsequent packets. Compare the differences here. In circuit switching, we established a physical circuit from source to destination. We don't transmit as packets, we just send the data as an entire set. That is, it's not divided up. So we can think we transmit our signal from the source, the signal propagates through node two, through node three and is received at the destination node four. So the time to get the first, say, bit of data from here to here, it depends upon the propagation delay, which depends upon the distance of those links. And we do that for all bits of the data. Transmit the first bit, the second bit, and the last bit. If we had our, before we had 3,000 bytes, the transmission time would depend upon our data rate of our links. But with packet switching, we transmit a packet at a time. And we cannot send it across the next link until the entire packet's received. 
transmit the first packet and then this node must wait until the end of that packet is received before it can send it across the next node. That's the difference here. So this time is the same, but we have an additional delay here which extends across those links. And so the time to deliver the data in packet switching is longer than in circuit switching because we must process one packet at a time. Datagram packet switching, well that's easy. We don't do these steps. We don't set up a connection. We just send the packets immediately across the links. So the time, time to deliver the data, these are the same, except we don't have this initial step of establishing a connection. We sem simply send the data. <coughs> so let's look at some trade-offs that we can see in terms of timing at least. Datagram packet switching can be faster to deliver the data in overall because we don't have this initial step of setting up a connection. We don't have this process in both of the circuit switching based techniques. So if we have a small amount of data to send, then datagram packet switching is often better because we don't waste time of setting up a connection. We just send that data and that's finished. But if we have a large amount of data to send, you expand this out and same here, then the, la the more data to send, the less significant the time to set up the connection. If this was, say, one second and this was one second, then the connection setup takes half of the time. But if this was one second and this was 1,000 seconds, the connection setup takes just 1,000th of, of the time. It's very small. It doesn't matter so much. So with a large amount of data, these two become reasonable in terms that the overhead of setting up a connection is much less. With a small amount of data, the overhead of setting up a connection is quite significant. That's one trade-off that arises. Compare these two. This one will always take more time compared to circuit switching. Because once we set up a connection, even if this takes the same time, with circuit switching we can send the data all the way through without having to be processed at the intermediate nodes. Packet switching we must process each packet at the intermediate nodes, introducing a delay. So they are two of the trade-offs in terms of performance, comparing these. Of course, the exact performance will depend upon how much data, how many links, and the speeds and characteristics of those links. If we had, here we just have three links, if we had 10 links, then the same approach would apply that we transmit a packet across the first link and then the second link, the third link, fourth link, and so on. The first packet would arrive much later than when we use this case. So the more links, the larger the delay for packet switching compared to circuit switching. Because with more links, there are more intermediate nodes and more processing at these intermediate nodes. Circuit switching, you can think that there's no processing at intermediate nodes and therefore it doesn't matter how many there are, it just depends upon the distance. What else can we say from this diagram? <coughs> Not much at the moment. Any questions? on this, at least about the, this diagram and the differences between the three. One way to think about the differences between circuit and packet switching, circuit switching deals with signals. Think, once we set up a connection, we have a link, a physical link from source to destination. And we just transmit a signal across that link. And to calculate the time it takes, 
it's as if we just have one link. You can calculate the propagation and transmission delay for sending data across this link. So with circuit switching, we have a link once we've set up the connection. With packet switching, it's not like that. We need to process the packet at each intermediate node. That introduces delay. So a question, a typical question in an exam or a quiz is, given some scenario which you draw a diagram like this, perhaps more importantly, given something like this, calculate the time it takes to get the data from source to destination. If you know the time it takes to transmit a packet across each link, you can calculate the transmission and propagation delay and then to come back and the transmission and propagation delay of each of the packets until you get the final time, the time at which the data is received. Any questions? We have time for some questions. We'll have a little bit more discussion of the trade-offs and then an example. Any questions on the differences between the three so far? Everything's okay? Uh, okay, uh, the question is why isn't datagram packet switching good for a large amount of data? In fact, if I said that, then I was wrong. My point is that the more data, if we have a large amount of data, then this becomes very similar to this. If you imagine this diagram where there's not three packets but 3,000 packets, and you draw both of these diagrams, then most of the time would be spent transmitting packets. The overhead of setting up a connection would be very minimal. So datagram packet switching from that perspective is not bad for long, large amount of data. It's just that with a large amount of data, this becomes similar to datagram packet switching. With a small amount of data, this can be inefficient. That's, maybe that's the main point. One thing these diagrams don't show is that datagram packet switching, the packets may go across different paths. Both of these, the data goes along the same path. In datagram packet switching, one packet may go this direction and one may go in this direction. That can create problems because packet, packet one may arrive before packet three. Or that it's not shown in this case. That's one of the different trade-offs. Any other questions? Mm -hmm. Yes, so circuit switching will always be less time than virtual circuit packet switching. So what's the advantage of virtual circuit packet switching? When we look at, the, I think, the next slide or one of the other slides, using packet switching is of benefit because yesterday we saw the case with circuit switching, we establish a connection and we reserve resources for that connection. And those resources are allocated for the dura duration of the connection. No one else can use them. With packet switching, that's not necessarily the case. Let's give an example. <coughs> we saw yesterday, if we want to establish a connection from A to B, let's say the data rate, to keep it simple, every, this link has a data rate of one megabit per second, and A wants to create a connection to B using one megabit per second, it reserves one megabit per second, then 
it establishes a connection from A to B, reserving the full one megabit per second across this link. It has a capacity of one. This connection has preserved that capacity of one megabit per second. If someone else tries to establish a connection, it will be rejected because we cannot take away that capacity from A and B. With datagram packet switching, that's not necessarily true. Because we deal with packets, even though we may reserve one megabit per second here, it may not be a hard allocation. That is, if no one else is using this one megabit per second at some point in time, someone else can use that connection. So let's say we've reserved one megabit per second, but we're currently only using 500 kilobits per second, half of it. That is, the connection from A to B is sending at a rate of 500 kilobits per second. They reserved one, but they're only using half of it at this point in time. Now this one wants to send from C to D at 300 kilobits per second. With circuit switching, we cannot establish a connection from C to D because the resources are allocated for that circuit. With packet switching, in some cases, we can establish a connection. That is, we can allow a connection, but we don't have a hard limit. We say, okay, you can use, you can use the capacity of this link so long as no one else is using it. We send our packets. If no one else is using it, or it's not fully utilized at this point in time, someone's using 500 of the one megabit per second, therefore there's half of the capacity remaining, we'll send our packets and those packets will be delivered across that link. So allowing us to send our packets from C to D at 300 kilobits per second. If this one starts to increase its sending rate to one megabit per second for a short period of time, this one is now fully utilized. We're using the one megabit per second out of the one megabit per second capacity. If this one continues to send packets, they'll arrive at this switch and be put in a queue. They'll wait until there's an opportunity, that is until this one decreases its sending rate. So he can, C can keep sending, but the packets won't get to the destination. They'll be put in a queue until there's a little bit of capacity on this link to send them. And then the packets will be slowly sent across the link to D. So in this way, if, for example, there's only a short period of time when A is sending at the full one megabit per second to B, during that time, the packets will be delayed in this switch. They'll be queued. But then if A slows down, those packets will go through. So with packet switching, both of the virtual circuit and datagram packet switching, we can be more efficient in utilizing the links because if the links are fully in use, we can send our packets through. If they are fully in use, our packets will be delayed until some capacity becomes available. So the delay of the packets may go up, but they may still eventually get delivered to the destination. Real circuit switching, that's not possible. We allocate the resources for that circuit, no one else can use them. So that's the advantage of packet switching compared to circuit switching, and applies to both of these. It can be more inefficient if the sending rates are going up and down. When you make a voice call and you talk, the amount of data you send is about the same all the time. You're talking, that generates data or signals, that's about the same. When you access a website, the amount of data your computer sends goes up and down over time. Sometimes you're sending a little bit to request a web page, and then for three minutes you're reading the web page, you're sending nothing. So the amount your computer is sending is peaking and then goes down to zero, and then peaks for a short time and then goes down. So accessing a web page, packet switching makes sense because while you're sending nothing, other people's packets can be sent through. 
And while you're sending something, then hopefully other, pa other people's packets will be, will, will be delayed slightly and then get to send through when you're sending nothing again. So when the varying sending, or when we have varying sending rates, packet switching makes, becomes more efficient. When we have fixed sending rates, circuit switching can be relevant. I hope that is summarised a little bit in some of these slides. This lists some of the advantages, or compares the three approaches. Some of them are obvious. Circuit switching, there's a dedicated transmission path, a physical path from source to destination. Packet switching, there's not. It's not dedicated for that connection. Right, here we deal with transmission of packets. Here we have a continuous transmission of data, of signals. In packet switching, the packets may be stored in a queue or in memory in a node and then sent later. In circuit switching, that's not the case. The data flows through. It's not stored in the intermediate node. That's good for performance of circuit switching, but it doesn't allow other people to share the link. Circuit switching has some call setup delay, establish the connection, has some delay. So it's virtual circuit packet switching. <coughs> what else can we see here? If, uh, if the receiver is busy, then there's a busy signal indicated to the source when we try to set up a connection in both the circuit switching approaches. Uh, some of them are not, uh, you can look through some of them, not so important right now. Uh, one of them is, oh, this is the point that we just mentioned. With circuit switching, essentially we have a fixed amount of bandwidth available for a connection. It cannot change and no one else can take that away. With packet switching, the amount of bandwidth allocated can be dynamic, it can go up and down. And that's better suited to applications where the amount of bandwidth they require or the rate at which they send goes up and down. We can adapt as the user sends more, we can give more bandwidth. In circuit switching, once we've set up the connection, there's no overhead, there's no header in circuit switching. In packet switching, each packet has a header and that introduces overhead. They are perhaps the main trade-offs between the three approaches. Let's go back. In terms of packet switching, the size of the packet has an impact on performance. I gave an example where we had 3,000 bytes and we divide it into 1,000 byte packets. This tries to illustrate the impact of different packet sizes. The blue rectangles are the headers. And the header size is fixed in packet switching, or in all these three cases. And these are the three links, from X to source to A to B to Y, three links. If we have a very large packet, let's say we have 3,000 bytes of data, and the packet contains 3,000 bytes. So we have one packet to send this case. We transmit the packet from the source to node A. When that packet is received and it's in full, it is transmitted across the second link from A to B. And when B receives it in full, it's transmitted across the third link to the destination Y. This case shows us, okay, what happens if Instead of having one packet to carry all the data, we split it into two packets, so half the size. We transmit packet one and then packet two from source to node A. But when we, or after we've transmitted packet one from X to A, the packet has been received by node A. While we're transmitting packet two from X to A, 
A can start transmitting packet 1 from A to B. That's what's happening at this time. Packet 2 is being sent across the first link from X to A. At the same time, packet 1 is being sent across the second link from A to B. They're happening in parallel at the same time. That saves time because we're transmitting some data or we're receiving some data and transmitting other data at the same time. And in this case, the total time from the start to the finish can be less than if we have a large packet. So that's the advantage of having smaller packets here. We can transmit, or the total time to deliver the data can be less than with larger packets. And this is a further example where we divide it into five packets. Smaller packets, same amount of total data, transmit packet one, while we're transmitting packet two on the first link, we're transmitting packet one on the second link. While we're transmitting packet three on the first link, we're transmitting packet two on the second link and packet one on the third link. So we've got full utilization of those three links at the same time. All packets arrive in a shorter time than here and here. Smaller packet, less total transmission time. That's the advantage of the smaller packet. But we have headers. Every packet has a header. And if that header is fixed, the blue rectangles, here's a case where we have 10 packets, even smaller packets again. With our three links, the total time is slightly larger than this one. Because with 10 packets, we now have 10 headers to send. With five packets, we just have five headers to send. The transmission overhead of headers becomes quite large in this case. And therefore, the total time is larger than this case. So there's a trade-off that are involved, is involved here. Smaller packets can mean we can transmit some packets in parallel across each link. With two packets, we're sending across one link and another link at the same time. And with five and ten packets, we're sending across the three links at the same time. That reduces total time. But the more packets, the more header overhead, and that can increase the total time. So the, the best option, you need to compare those two factors. If we have a quiz when next, next week, if I give you, say, packet sizes, if I say you have 10,000 bytes of data, two options, packet size 1, 10,000 bytes, packet size 2, 5,000 bytes, you should be able to calculate the total time it takes to deliver the data across the links and find out which option is better. It would depend upon the data rate, the packet size, the header size, and the number of links. You should be able to calculate that and compare the two. Are you happy to have a quiz on that next week? Maybe? Well, that's good. Any problems? The concepts, at least. The calculations may take time, but at least try to understand the concepts here. Everything going fine back here? <laughs> Just all right? I think next week we may move you to the front. That may be even better. Yep. No. All these three on the slide are packet switching. All. If I wanted to draw circuit switching, it would be... Uh, if I wanted to draw circuit switching, if I try to repeat what those diagrams have, I have the data, no header with circuit switching, and 
In fact, in these diagrams, it doesn't show propagation delay. It assumes the propagation delay is zero in these cases. That is, we just have transmission delay here. So with circuit switching, if we follow the same approach, with zero propagation delay, that's it. Transmit the data from the source and it flows all the way through to the destination. Whereas with packet switching, transmit the data on the first link, when that's received, then send across the second link and then the third link. So circuit switching much better than all those cases. No header and you don't have to wait at the intermediate nodes to transmit it again. It transmitted across the entire path. Of course, th this does not show the s setting up of connections. That's extra. Any other questions before we move on? I think we've covered the main concepts. I think that's probably enough detail for this course. Compare the three, understand the difference between the three. Um, there are many details that we have not covered, but I think you should know the main concepts of what they are and be able to compare when they're good for particular, particular applications. So circuit switching is, was built for telephone networks and still ex exists. Packet switching has been deployed over the last 30 or 40 years and is what is used in the internet today. But in fact, the internet or the links in the internet still use circuit switching. When you connect on your ADSL home phone line, you're using circuit switching. Your telephone network that you connect over uses circuit switching. But when you're sending your data from your computer to the Facebook web server, that's using, in fact, datagram packet switching across that network. So there's still both of them are in use today. <coughs> datagram packet switching will focus on more because that's what's used in the internet today. Next topic. Actually, not next topic, the quiz. That may be better. <laughs> 